Today I'll be talking about international students and you understand why I'm talking about international students. Not just because I work with international students, but because it is such a strategic way to reach the world. And I'll explain very shortly. Next week, um, I'll preach about the power to do missions, which is the Holy Spirit. And um, probably Stefan will be here. You remember him from Carpen Way? He'll be here probably to also talk about, he's going to Cambodia on missions and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see whether he can come and share with us what he's going to do there and we'll think about it as a church whether we want to support him, his ministry so that's going to happen next week and then the following week i'm going to be in ghana for a week um for some of you may not know but a lot of the people who support our ministry are from ghana and that 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 that's awesome so i'm going to see them and just tell them what has been happening this year and what's going to happen next year and stuff like that. So I'll be in Ghana for a week. That week, while I'm not here, Andrew Barron will preach. He's from Jews for Jesus. All right. So what, 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 what role do Jews play in God's salvation plan? All right. It's important that we know about that as well. So that will be the last in our series on missions and evangelism. And then we'll get into the Christmas story after that. Okay, so we're going to end with the Jews. The story started with the Jews. We'll end with the Jews. <laughs> Great. So, you know we've been looking at purpose. We've been looking at raison death. The reason why we live. And many people do not understand what life is about. But we've been looking through the scriptures trying to find out what is life about. And in the past few weeks we've discovered that there are five reasons why God has put us here. God has put us here for worship, to bring him pleasure. He's put us here for fellowship, for relationship with one another and with him. He's put us here to become like him. It's called discipleship. We walk with him, we look like, we talk like him, we emulate him until we look like him. It's called discipleship. And that's why we read the Bible, that's why we pray, that's why we have fellowship. So we look more and more and more and more like him. Number four, he put us here for service. To be of use to one another. To serve each other with the gifts and the talents that he is giving us. With the callings and the passions that we have. That's why we are here. If you are not worshipping, if you are not fellowshipping, if you are not growing to become more and more like Christ in discipleship, if you are not serving, then you are not serving the purpose. You are not living out the reason why God put you on earth. This is our raison death. And for the past few weeks, we've been focusing on the last of our raison death, which is missions and evangelism, sharing with others the good news about Jesus Christ, booming and beaming the good news, booming us with our mouth, us with our voices, but beaming with our lives and our love. This is our raison death, and a church that is not involved in missions and evangelism is no church at all. Because these are the very last words that Jesus left us. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. But we've made it very clear right from the beginning that this has always been God's idea. In Genesis when he called Abraham, he said, Abraham, through you I want to bless all people. God's idea has always been that the whole earth, that all people will come to know him and serve him and worship him. So right from Genesis, we see that. Right up to Revelation, from the first book of the Bible to the last book of the Bible, is the same story. So in Revelation chapter 7, John says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could number. So many people from every nation, every tribe, every people and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb and worshipping, saying, salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord and unto his Lamb. That is God's heartbeat. This is God's obsession, if you like. That all the nations will come to know and will come to serve him. But we've been looking at the fact that, unfortunately, in our world today, you see, the Bible says every nation, this means every people group, the word there, go to all nations, is the Greek word patata ethne. Pantata ethne means all people groups. And they're about, depending on who you listen to, but let's say there are about 12,000 people groups in the world. 6,000 have been reached. 6,000 have not been reached. 6,000 don't have more than 2% Christians. And 
three out of the 6,000 don't even have anybody working among them as a missionary. So we said, this is God's heartbeat, this is God's passion, but the reality is that though we are 2.3 billion Christians, 5 million churches, 23,000 denominations, to denominations, 12 million full-time Christian workers, though the command is very clear, go and make disciples of every nation, the work is still left undone. 4,000 languages without a Bible, 3,000 people groups with no missionary, 1 million villages without a church, 3.5 billion Hindus and Muslims and, and Buddhists and secularists who do not know the Savior. What is interesting though is this. God in his wisdom is bringing us people. And I want us to look at how we can easily count for zero. We can easily see the number of languages that have not been translated changed. We can easily see the number of people that are unreached changed. We can easily see the neighborhoods that do not have a church changed. If we look at these people that God has brought to Canada, these international students. So my aim this morning, let me show you, is to make us aware and sensitive to the fact that God moves us and moves people onto our paths for a season and for a reason. In fact, for a season or for a lifetime, but it's always for a reason. Sarah, there's a reason you have come to Canada. Sarah's from the Philippines. There's a reason you have come to Canada at this particular time. We have met for a reason. God always brings people our paths. It may be for a season. And you need to be wise about that because some of you are crying because you used to be very close friends with somebody. Now they moved to another city and you are so sad. God may bring some people into your life for a season. Some people will be in your lives for a lifetime. But it's always for a reason. And we're going to look at that very soon. And that, so my first aim is to show us that God always moves us and moves people into our paths for a season or a lifetime, but always for a reason. But then secondly, to show you that the people we are trying to reach, they are right here with us. The people we are trying to reach, they are right here with us. They are right at our doorsteps. And I'm going to prove it to you through some numbers and through some stories. Okay. So I'm going to speak in three short parts. First, I'll talk about the fact that God moves people where he wants. Secondly, God meets people where they are at. And finally, God moves and meets people strategically. I'm talking about how can we get involved in this whole count for zero. And I'm saying international students are a strategic starting point. If you can start reaching out to the international students in our city, and I'll show you some numbers, McGill alone has 8,300 international students. If we can start reaching these international students, majority of whom are from China, we can truly count for zero. I'm excited. This is, I, I love this. God, only God could have thought of this. It's amazing. All right. So we'll talk about the fact that, number one, God moves people where he wants. Number two, God meets people where they are at. And number three, God moves and meets people strategically. Let us turn our Bibles to Acts chapter, chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Are you there? Acts chapter 8. Let's read from verse 26. This is a story about Philip and the Ethiopian Enoch. Let's read from verse 26 to 40. Are you there? All right. Let's go. Let's read it together. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip. You need some more time. If, if you can't find it in the Bible, it's printed in the, in the bulletin. All right. Acts chapter, chapter 8 verse 26 to 40. Let's go. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. <laughs> so Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? 
And he said, oh, how can I? How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. Verse 34. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth. And beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water. Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized him. And when they came out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more. And went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus. And as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to to Caesarea. First point I want to make. God moves people where he wants. God moves people where he wants. You see, it's very clear from this passage You read verse 26, it starts by saying, An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go. God moves people. He said to Philip, Rise and go. Go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And verse 27a says, And he rose and went. I mean, it just reminds me, and it doesn't just remind you of the second week in January 2008 when we were reading the scriptures and God said, get up and go. Leave Ghana. Leave your country, your people, and your father's household. As Genesis chapter 12 verse 1 just came alive to us. God moves people where he wants. And don't forget that he had told me earlier on in Malaysia in 2006 at a conference that I didn't want to go anywhere. I said, I want to stay in Ghana. I want to make it in Ghana. Da, 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 da. And he says, it's my world and I send you where I want you. God moves people where he wants. And so here we have God telling Philip, get up and go. And Philip rose and went. Now, it's very, very interesting that At the same time God was asking Philip to get up and go, he had already moved someone to come from Ethiopia. Some believe it's Ethiopia, modern day Ethiopia. Some believe it's modern day Sudan. But whatever it is, he had moved somebody from Africa to come to Jerusalem to come and worship. And this guy was the Ethiopian minister of finance. This was the guy who was in charge, maybe if you like, the governor of the bank of Ethiopia. This was the guy who was in charge of the money of the Queen Candace. He had come because he wanted to know God. He had come to worship in Jerusalem and he was going back. He was returning home in his chariot. So God who moved Philip and said, Arise and go, now in verse 29, says to Philip, Go over and join the chariot. People, God moves people where he wants. Either for a season or for a lifetime, but it's always for a reason. And let me tell you the two reasons why God moves people. God moves people either to spread his fame or to get to know his name. And I'll show it to you right now through scripture. Why do I say God, God moves people to spread his fame? Did you realize that the Bible says God asked Philip to go and he went to spread God's fame because this guy was reading the scriptures and did not understand. And after he was done with him, the Bible says in verse 40 that Philip found himself in Azotus because the Spirit of God carried him there. And he preached the gospel to all the towns. As he went to Caesarea, everywhere he went, he preached the gospel. That is why God moves us to spread his fame. And we see that in Acts chapter 8 verse 4. After Philip, uh, sorry, after, after Stephen had been stoned and the church was being persecuted... You know, God had told them, Jesus has told them that preach the gospel in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. You know what they were doing? They were staying in Jerusalem. 
and having a good time in Jerusalem. They were not going. And God allowed persecution to break out. And after persecution broke out, they started going. And so Acts chapter 8 verse 4 says, Those who had been scattered went about preaching the gospel. God sends people, God moves people either to spread his fame or to get to know his name. So Philip finds himself in Samaria because of this persecution that had broken up, broken out. And he's ministering to the people in Samaria. He used to be in Jerusalem. Now they moved from Jerusalem to Judea. Now from Judea to Samaria. He's having this great time in Samaria. People are being saved. People are being healed. And all of that. And all of a sudden God says, Now it's good you're in Samaria, but I'm going to move you. Go. There's a chariot I want you to go and speak to. That's how God moved me, people. Like I keep saying, I did not come to Canada because I wanted to. God wanted to move me because he wanted to spread his fame through me. And I get amazed. I, I, if, I don't know whether you got my email this morning, Michelle, that God moved some people from China and brought them to Montreal. And they started Grace Church. Or they started the MCAC. And later founded Grace Church 25, 25, 27 years ago. And through the people God moved from China to come and live in Montreal, who came to know his name, he's now spreading his fame. Now, someone like Michelle is Quebecois. How did Michelle come to find Christ? Because there was a Chinese called Jenny, who God moved from China, who got to know Christ, and through her, you got to know him, and through her, brought him to church. Now, Michelle has become a believer in Christ. I've been going through Michelle, with Michelle through, actually we do Skype. Uh, for the past few weeks we've been doing Skype meetings and sometimes phone call meetings. Just going through baptism messages and uh, uh, courses and teaching him what, what believing in Christ means, what being baptized means. And uh, Caleb and, uh, and Leon are going to continue that process. But Michelle, I hope you don't mind, but I want to share just a bit of the email you sent me on Friday. Is that okay? Listen to what he says. I'm just sh showing you that God moves people for a reason. He moves people to go and spread his fame. So because of some Chinese that God moved, who got to know Christ, now Christ has used that Chinese to reach out to a Quebecois. You wouldn't think God would use a Chinese to reach a Quebecois. Just like you wouldn't think God would use a Jew to reach an African. One of the reasons why I think this guy came all the way to Jerusalem and was going back without anybody preaching to him, maybe it was because he was black. Maybe, I don't know. But he was obviously different. From the people around him. Listen to what Michelle wrote. I'm just reading a part of his email on Friday. Because we had our last session on Thursday. Thursday night. He says, thank you again for the time you gave me for the baptism courses. This has been very productive for me. In fact, through my relationship with Jenny, I was brought to have other contacts and knowledge that I would never imagine alone in my castle. <laughs> as she calls it. I totally believe this is God's will. Every day brings me a renewal of my soul and of my spirit and my heart. I can tell that I'm in a continuous reborn process since I met Jenny and introduced to the church community. I can only thank Jesus and God for all this blessing and also thank you for your prayer and your blessing. Do you understand what is happening? God moves people so that they come across our path. It may be for a season or it may be for a lifetime. But it's always for a reason. You know, as we work with international students, we, 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 we've been opening new work in all kinds of cities. In Brandon, in, in Manitoba, you know the people that started our work in Brandon? We had no work in Brandon. We used to have work in Brandon among international students. It closed down a number of years ago. You know the people who started the new work in Brandon? They were not staff. They were not even adults. They were international students from Nigeria. They got to Brandon and said, Why, how come we don't have a ministry here? Let's start one. I want to tell you that God moves people to spread his fame. God moves people so that they will spread his aroma. But you see, the other reason why God moves people is so that they get to know his name. So some go to spread his fame, but some need to move so that they get to know him. And I see this all the time, especially students from China and India. A lot of students from India, have, they have all these idols all around them. They don't even think of anything as like idols, idols, idols. They move to Canada and all of a sudden the environment has changed and all of a sudden they begin to be open. Last week when I was in Winnipeg, some of the people that come for Bible study, 
through our ministry are from Iran, Jordan. These are places where they will not have the opportunity to seek after Christ because it's so dangerous. But God moves them to Canada and all of a sudden they're like, ooh, freedom. Maybe I can start exploring if there's truth in what the Christians say. Are you getting what I'm saying? God moves people. Some to go and spread his fame, but others to go and know his name. And if you don't mind, why don't you look at Acts chapter 17. Let me read verse 26 and 27. Acts chapter 17. Now this is Paul who is preaching at the Areopagus. And he says, God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. Having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling places, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Do you understand what Paul is saying? Paul is saying that God determines our times and exactly where we live. Why? So that men will seek him. So, so there are people who move to Canada thinking, oh, I'm coming to get a degree. But God moves them because he's actually getting them salvation. There are people that come to Canada because, oh, there's war in my country. I'm a refugee. That's why they think they are coming to Canada, not knowing that God is going to save them. So God moves people so that they can have salvation. That's what the Bible is saying. God determines our times and our places, the exact places where we should live, so that men will seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him. So we realize that while God was moving the Ethiopian to find him, God was moving Philip to show him. Let me ask you, where is God moving you to? And why? People movements are God movements. And you know what excites me? As I travel the past few months, I've been to every single province in Canada. And I see the same pattern happening. In Canada has one of the highest immigration rates in the world. Do you know? I see that immigration has been more than ever before in the history of the world. People are moving. Right now there are 230 million migrants in the world. Why are people moving so much? For me, it's because God is at work. God is moving people both to spread his name, spread his fame, and to get to know his name. God moves people where he wants. It's his world. And he moves people where he wants. But the second thing I want you to note is this. God meets people where they are at. So God moves people and then he moves. Says, Look at the Ethiopian. He was curious but he was confused. It, it reminds me of so many international students and new migrants and refugees. They come to Canada, they want to learn about the culture, they wonder what, what this snowy thing, powdery thing is, why it's so cold, they want to learn about Thanksgiving, why do you guys eat turkey, and uh, why, why do people, why, why is God in your national anthem? They are curious, but they are confused. This is just like the Ethiopian eunuch. The Bible says in verse 27b to 29, he had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And he did not understand. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? Do you know how come some of these students come to know Christ? Just because somebody guided them. <laughs> we say very interesting things in, in North America like, Can I pick your brains for a moment? What do we mean by that? Can I pick your brains? It means can I get an idea from you? Can I, can I get your opinion? But somebody coming from a different culture is like, huh? You want to pick my brains? <laughs> These students are exposed to all kinds of language, all kinds of things that they do not understand. And we are the Philips who must come, come alongside them and ask, do you understand what you are reading? But I love verse 35. That's the key verse. Because God meets people where they are at. Verse 35, the Bible says, Then Philip went to the child, 35. Philip opened his mouth and beginning with the scripture he was reading, he told him the good news about Jesus Christ. That is how God works. God looks for you. He meets you where you are at. And he uses the very situation you are in. The very thing you need. The very thing you are looking for. And he gets to show you the great gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the same thing Jesus did with the Samaritan woman. He meets this woman at the well. How does Jesus begin the conversation about salvation? Will you give me a drink? 
and they start talking about water. And the woman starts talking about the who builds the well and how the well is deep and da, da, da. And God, Jesus uses water which the woman had come to get and began to show her how there's water that will never run out. God meets us where we are at. Paul did the same thing in Athens. Actually, the scripture we just read from Acts 17 where the Bible says God moves people so that they get to know him. Beginning earlier on in that scripture, we are told that Paul was meeting in the Areopagus. And he said to the people of Athens, he said, I see that you are in everywhere religious. Acts 17, 23. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. And then he says, so you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. So because they had an altar, they had all these gods in their, in their, in their, in their, in their city. But they said, hey, maybe we left one God out. So let's build an altar and call it to an unknown God. And so Paul sees that altar and says, you know what? Let me tell you about this unknown God. So he starts where they are at. And then he winds around to share the gospel with them. People, it's the same thing with these people that have come to Canada. And I'm going to show you very soon. Because some of these, many of these have come as students. Some of them are struggling with English. And so we reach out to them with English as a second language, teaching them how to write their essays and how to get better at English. And because we meet them where they are at, soon they begin to ask about Jesus Christ. Downstairs, every Saturday, there's ESL. That couple have been doing it for years. And so many people come to Jesus. Why? They come to Canada as immigrants. They want to learn some English. And Ted and Margaret said, we'll teach you English. We'll meet you where you are at. But we'll teach you English using the Bible as text. How many of you have been to that class before? I know a number of you who were saved because of that class. None. None was telling me that's how she came to know Jesus, because of that class. So you see, God meets us where we are at. A lot of these students who come to Canada are looking for family. They are looking for friendship. They are looking for a home away from home. And I'm going to share something about that before we close, about how we can make this happen. So God not only moves people, he meets people where they are at. And we see the Ethiopian eventually got to understand when, Paul, when, 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 when Philip explained the scriptures. And he said, I believe, can I be baptized? I'm going to share some numbers with you. Our ministry reaches about 20,000 international students every year. The last year, about 50 of them gave their lives to Jesus. And almost about the same number got baptized. It reminds you of this guy who traveled to be saved and got baptized. Let me end with why God moves and meets people strategically. And that is the meat of what I'm going to say because that excites me so much. I love the words of Bill Bright. Bill Bright started Campus Crusade for Christ, what is known as Power to Change today. And Bill Bright said, you know, every soul is equally precious in God's sight. But not every soul is equally strategic. In other words, if you were the only one left on earth, Christ would still have come to die. If there was only one soul left, Christ would still have come to die. But not every soul gives the same returns. And this scripture in Acts chapter 8 for me, is proof of this. Because when we say something is strategic, it means how do you get the most bang for your back, right? It means something that you can make the most out of, something that is opportune. So, for example, in Jerusalem, why did God allow the Holy Spirit to come at the time of Pentecost? Because he knew that so many nations would come to Jerusalem at that time. And so he pours the Spirit on the people, and the disciples begin to speak in various languages. And people who have come from all over the world hear the gospel in their language. And from there, they go and share it. God is a God of strategy. God is a strategic God. And you see how it's amazing in Acts chapter 8, as we read about Philip. Philip was having a good time in Samaria. There were so many people that were being saved in Samaria. But you know what God does? He pulls Philip. In fact, the Bible says there were crowds. Crowds that were being saved in Samaria. Philip, God pulls Philip from the crowds to go after how many people? One guy. Because he was strategic. This guy will go back to Ethiopia. This guy will go back to Africa with the gospel. And anybody who knows the history of the church in Africa will tell you, especially in Ethiopia and North, in Northeast Africa, will tell you that this guy brought the gospel back. 
That is how strategic international students are. And I'm going to show you a few things that show that. Because you see, we've been talking about counting for zero. We want to see a time when there are zero languages without a scripture. Zero people groups without disciple makers. Zero people who have not heard the gospel. Zero oral learners without a Bible. Zero villages or neighborhoods without a church. We want to count for zero. And I'm telling you that as we want to count for zero, the people that are going to make this happen are right here among us. The international students that God has brought. Just like the Ethiopian eunuch that God brought to Jerusalem. So in our ministry, in ISMC, we said, just like these organizations want to count for zero, we want to count for zero too. We have a big dream that in 10 years, zero international students will come to Canada and not have the opportunity to be loved and led by us or churches like you and churches in Vancouver, wherever, that we have stimulated, we have catalyzed and say, let's reach these students. Would you believe that students can come and study here for four years and 70 to 80% of them will never get to enter a Canadian home? 70 to 80% of these students will never get to enter a Canadian home. We want that to change. You know why? Because these students are strategic. I'm going to show you very soon why it makes so much sense to reach out to these students. Because like the Ethiopian eunuch, these students are mobile. Like the Ethiopian eunuch, these students are leaders. These are the brightest and the best from their countries. And then they go back, they make an impact. It will reach them. I'll show you a few stories before we close. So what I'm saying is that the people we are trying to reach are here. The people we are trying to reach, some of these students speak four or five languages. And here we are saying we need people to translate scripture. Duh. Open your eyes and look, church. And I'm saying this with all the energy I can get because I'm telling you, as I travel around, around the country, sometimes my heart bleeds because I see churches that are emptying, crying for membership. And I see international students that are lonely, crying for fellowship. And they are passing right in front of the doors of the church. And the churches don't even see. I, and these are the same churches. And some of them are Chinese students. And these are the same churches that are sending money to China. So we want to read Chinese. We want to read Chinese. And God has brought the Chinese in front of your door. You want to count for zero? I want to tell you the people we want to reach are here. Not only, I'll give you an example very soon, but you, how do you find this picture? How do you like this picture? What's wrong with this picture? Lisa, what's wrong with this picture? Well, I think they are looking on the wrong side. <laughs> the thing they are looking for is looking for them. And that's, for me, that's the way I see these international students and these migrants and these refugees that have come to Canada. We are trying to reach them, but God has brought them here. And we don't even see they are hidden in plain sight. Let me show you this. Remember I showed you this before, that unreached people groups in North America, in the U.S. and Canada, there's anything between 374 and 541 unreached people groups right here in North America. And these are the people we are trying... Let me tell you something. One of the least rich people groups in the world are the Nepali. The people from Nepal, the people from Bhutan. Let me show you something with you. Do you know? I was in Winnipeg recently and I was telling them, in Winnipeg alone, there are 600 Nepali. This girl from Nepal, where, where is it? I, I, I'll show you later on. There's a girl from Nepal who is, who is itching to come and study at the University of Guelph. And I'm thinking, is there a church in the University of Guelph or in the Guelph area that realizes that one of the least rich people groups in the world is moving right next door? Church? I met J.D. Payne in Toronto he wrote this book called Strangers Next Door. Listen to what J.D. Payne says. He's a pastor in Alabama. He says, something is missiologically malignant when we are willing to send people across the oceans, risking life and limb and spending enormous amounts of money, but we are not willing to walk next door and minister to the strangers living there. I think it's hypocrisy of the highest order. That we claim we, are want to, we want to reach the world and we send money and what not to the world and yet when God brings the world to us, we don't see them or we are not interested. There is a problem. I'm talking about the fact that international students are a strategic point, a strategic starting point if we want to reach the world. 
if we truly want to count for zero. And you know what I see? That both the harvest and the harvesters are here. Because not only are they here to be saved, but those who are also going to reach their own people are here. If we reach them and envision them and train them and say, go and reach your people. I want to end with four reasons why it just makes sense to reach these students. And I want us to pray and ask God, God, what do you want me to do about it? I have a few assignments for you. For example, there are some Bibles at the back I'm going to give you to look for an international student and give to the person. Because you never know. You never know. See, why this makes sense. And you can see these are West Jet colors. Did you notice? There's a town called Fort St. John in BC, northern BC, that wanted West Jets to be landing there. And, they, and so they did a whole social media campaign. Say, hey, hey, West Jet, you must come to, you know, uh, YouTube videos. Or they say, it makes sense. It just makes sense for West Jet to land in Fort St. John. Anyway, I don't know whether it makes sense, but somehow West Jet is landing there now. <laughs> but this really makes sense. I want to give you four reasons why it makes sense to reach out to these students. Number one, it's a statistically sensible thing to do. What do I mean by that? The numbers make sense. You see, in 1975, there were 800,000 international students in the world. You fast forward to now, and there are 4.5 million international students in the world. People who are steady in a country other than the one they are citizens of. I'm going to be in, in the Philippines or in March. And the church in the Philippines is asking us to help them with training people who can reach international students. But guess what? There are over 60,000 international students in the Philippines. China has so many international students from Africa and other places in the world. There are 4.5 million people who are studying in the country other than the ones they are citizens of. How does Canada come in? Listen, Canada has over two, in fact, the latest numbers is that Canada has 293,000 international students. In 2012 alone, the government let in 100,000 international students, just in one year. And guess what? The government wants to double the number of international students by 2022. Why? Why? It's good money. These students add $8 billion to our economy every year. But you see, I don't have a problem with that. Let governments do what governments must do. Let universities do what universities must do. The question is, is the church doing what the church must do? Guess who else should be doing the math? And I can tell you with every authority that I've been to every single province except PEI, I am yet to see one church or even one denomination that has a strategic paper that says, listen, we have seen the missiological opportunity and this is our response. We need to do something about this. See, Concordia has 4,600 international students. McGill has 8,300. Look at University de Montreal, 7,000. Most of them, of the international students, are from Francophone Africa. <laughs> University of Laval. No, even when you go to Sherbrooke, between Bishops, between Bishops University and University of Sherbrooke, they have about 2,000 international students. Guys, it makes sense to reach these students. I'm saying it's a statistically sensible thing to do. University of Toronto has 67,000 undergraduate students. 10,200 of them are international. Look at that. 15,000, almost 16,000 graduate students, 2,300 are international. So in, in University of Toronto alone, between their three campuses, they have 12,500 international students. And you know something that really intrigued me? Look at the top two countries of international students at U of T, which is the, Canada's number one university. The top two countries are China and India. Do you know what is special about these two countries? Don't forget, we're talking about counting for zero. China and India have the most unreached people groups in the world. And those are the two countries that send the most students to Canada. God moves people. And God makes us meet people. And I'm asking us, are we going to do anything about this? So number one, it's a statistically sensible thing to do. But number two, we know it's a scripturally sound thing to do. I'm not going to preach about that because I've shared enough scripture with you. But Leviticus 19 says that love the stranger as yourself. And you and I know, the Bible says when the stranger lives in your town, in your city, love him as yourself. And I'm going to throw a challenge to the, to the families here. That this Christmas, let's get an international person to come and have Christmas dinner, Christmas lunch. Let us love the stranger as ourselves. You were here when last year, was it last year or last two years, we had to do a ceremony for Legion. You remember? 
an international student who came to a city and somebody decided to kill him and to dismember him. Maybe if one of us had been friends with him, maybe, I don't know, maybe that wouldn't have happened. We don't know. But the church has a responsibility towards strangers. Jesus said one day, you know, one day Jesus, some of you are going to say, Jesus is going to say to you in heaven, oh, you know, I was a stranger and you took me in. And you're like, oh, Jesus, when did I see you as a stranger? And you say, what you did for that international student, you did for me. This Christmas, people will be going home. Some of these students cannot even pay to go home. And if you allow them to come and stay in your house for one week, that's like inviting Jesus to come and stay with you. So it's a scripturally sound thing to do. I already talked about it. You see, God brought the nations to Jerusalem. I talked about how God brings people to spread his fame. The believers who were scattered preach the gospel about Jesus wherever they went. And God brings people that they may find him. You see, God determined the time set for people and the exact places where they should live. Why? God did this so that men should, would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him. So we know it's a scripturally sound thing to do. You know why I show the picture of this girl? This is the girl who is coming from Nepal, who wants to be at the University of Guelph. And I'm telling you, the Nepali are one of the least rich people groups in the world. And she's coming right here. Are we going to do anything about it as the body of Christ? The harvest is here and the harvesters are here. Jesus said, go to all the world. Guess what? The world has come to us. I want to round up by telling you, and it's so simple to reach out to these students. You know, I, I, missions has never been simpler. You don't, have, you don't need a passport, you don't need a visa, you don't need to take shots, and you say you're a missionary. And you are, because the nations are here. You can, when you go to McGill campus, you can find people from about 140 or 150 different nations of the world. Where, where do you want to go as a missionary? I'll send you to McGill. Or to Concordia. The nations are Can you teach me English? Missions has never been simpler. I want to leave you with the last reason why this just makes sense. Because you see, God is a God of strategy. Look at what God is doing. This is a strategically smart thing to do. You know, the Lausanne movement, which was started by Billy Graham, and uh, others like John Stott helped to cement it. In February, they issued a press release and mentioned strategic global leadership roles in the world right now. Look at me. They mentioned me here because of international student ministries. Lausanne recognizes that this is a strategic thing that God has given us in Canada. Why? The majority of young people in the world under 14 are not born into a Christian home. But God brings them to places like Canada. Look at this guy, Kenji. Kenji came to us in Calgary from a Buddhist family. He came to a Christian home. And Kenji came to know the Lord Jesus. Guess what? If, if you, you, you've seen the, the, uh, the, news, the newsletters I gave you, some of my staff went to Japan recently and they went to visit Kenji. Kenji is back in Japan. Kenji did not only get saved in Canada. He's gone back to Japan and he's with Wycliffe. What does Wycliffe do? Bible translation. You are talking about languages that have not been reached. Here's an international student that has gone back and is in Wycliffe. Not just that. You are talking about 3.5 billion Buddhists that are not saved. You know what happened when Kenji went home? He began to speak to his family, to his society about Christ. His father became a believer. I'll show you a picture. This is his father's uh, 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 a relative, a Buddhist monk who is doing a ceremony. You know why he's doing this ceremony? Because Kenji's father became a Christian. And Kenji's father said, I want to be baptized. And not just I want to be baptized. I want you guys to take our names out of all the ancestral worship books. Let me read a part of the email. This email was sent in March. Kenji said, after my dad's baptism, he went on ahead to removing our family's membership from the Buddhist temple, as well as quit the deacon's role. For removing the membership, he had to sign a paper to terminate the existing relationship with the temple. Because my father, along with the Buddhist monk's family, this chap, is a direct descendant of the samurai who came to start this village in the 1500s. Do you understand what is going on? God uses a student, someone who thinks he's going to Canada to get a degree, to change 500, 600 years of history.
May the church wake up. Let me tell you. I, I know I, I talk like a madman, eh? On Saturday, I was telling God, God, if the church in Canada will not see what you are doing, take me back to Africa. I, I, honestly, I'd rather, God, I'd rather go back to Africa and help people with Ebola than talk to a church that is cold and is not seeing what God is obviously doing. You know, Kenji's father just passed away last month or two months ago. But he's died, but he's going into eternal life. All because his son came to Canada. And somebody, an ordinary person like you, took him to his home. And he came to know the Lord. This was a shrine, an Inari shrine that was in the house that has been removed from the house. I am telling you, if you want to count for zero, the harvesters are here. And the harvest is here. Let me end. Of course, we know it's strategic to reach these students because what? Charles Malik used to say that when you change the university, you change the world. The future world leaders are in McGill. They are in Concordia. They are UDM right now. You know this lady sitting here? She's doing a PhD in, in video games. She's going to determine how video games go. If she's evil, that's the kind of games we're going to get. Do you understand what I'm saying? The people that are shaping the world are in our universities right now. You know this guy? The North Korean leader. Do you know he used to be an international student? I was in a church in Calgary. And, and everybody was praying, God, you know, because he had just started killing Christians in, in North Korea. And people were praying, Lord, stop us, stop this e e evil man, blah, blah. And the Holy Spirit just whispered to me, but he was an international student. He used to study in Switzerland. What if the church in Switzerland had caught it? Billy Graham said, you might be the person that God uses to bring the next world leader into a personal relationship with Christ. You know the first Muslim female leader? She studied right here in North America. She studied in the States. I could give you a list of people, of world leaders, including rebel leaders, who studied here. I'm saying it's a strategic thing to reach out to these students because what? They will be saved and go and save their families because number two, they are those future leaders of the world. But number three, because you see, since 1989, we have prayed about the 1040 window. This region of the world is the hardest place to reach with the gospel. We call it the 1040 window. It's a region between latitude 10 degrees north and 40 degrees north. And you see, that is the world, two thirds of the world live there. Two thirds of the world in poverty live there. Two thirds of the world in Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, and animism live there. You see, and last year, I was praying about the 1040 window. And you know what God said to me? He said, but Yao, I am thinking outside the window. I'm actually writing a book with that title. I am thinking outside the window. You know what God showed me? He said, look, I'll put the brightest and the best out of the window. And I'll put them right beside you in Canada. I'll put them right in your backyard. Reach them and send them back into the window. Guys, and so you know what I did? I went to look for the, the records. This was, this, these were 2012, 2012 records. And I went to see wh which are the top sending countries of international students to Canada. Number one is China. Look at it. The stronghold of Buddhism. Number two is India. The stronghold of Hinduism. Number three is Korea. Still in the 1040 window. Number four is Saudi Arabia. The stronghold of Islam. You look at it. In one shot, God deals with it. All the major world religions, the 3.5 billion Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims were trying to reach with the good news about Jesus Christ and he's brought them to Canada and the church doesn't even see. Baksin came to us as a Sikh from India. Baksin becomes a Christian at the University of Manitoba just because a Christian found, made, took interest in him, just because a Philip saw that there's an Ethiopian Enoch that had come to Manitoba. You know what happens? He not only gets saved, Baksin goes back to India and plants 10,000 churches. You are talking about counting for zero. You see, let me tell you something as I end. It's very hard to go to the seashore and try and create a wave. I don't know how many of you can do that. Maybe you learned enough science. I did not learn enough science to make a wave. It's a hard thing to make a wave. But you can learn to surf waves that God has already made. For me, this is what it is. God has already made the waves. He's already bringing these students here. And there are more, there are, there's double the number that are going to come. The question is, are we going to see and do anything about it? God says, I'm doing a new thing. It springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert. So what are we going to do about this? Please pray. Please pray. Please pray. Ask God. God, show the church what to do. Show me as an individual what to do. And then you can plug in. You can, I'm going to show you some ways in which you can help. And then, of course, you can partner financially. I want to say right here that thank you very much. There are some people in this church that support our ministry. I'm not going to mention them because they'll be embarrassed. 
But you can do any of this. You can pray for us. You can plug in. You can partner. Listen, if you can help with English, t- tell Ted and Margaret, I want to help. And God will use you to bring people to him. One of the things I want us to start is something called the Friendship Partner Program. These are families in the church that just decide, I'm going to have an international, I'm going to, I'm going to be the host of an international center. Once a month, I'll give them a call. And once in a while, we maybe we are going to show them where Walmart is. Whatever. Let families in this church sign up. I'll be talking about this some more. And we, we want, I want someone who will coordinate this in the church, that there are families in this church that want to be, provide a home away from home for, for international students. I've given these Bibles out. These Bibles were printed by a ministry with Canadian Bible Society. It's a New Testament. Look for an international student and tell them that your pastor said you should give this to them as a gift. Many of them, especially those from China, I have seen one girl who said, I want to study the Bible. It was her first time she was coming into contact with this. Give this to somebody. In fact, in the beginning pages, there are stories of international students there. Testimonies of international students that have been touched here in Canada. Give this out to somebody. And the last thing is this. This Christmas, we'll be matching students to families. Please look at the details here and go to the website and sign up. If you know an international student, encourage them to go to the website and sign up so that they can go for a Christmas meal somewhere. But if you are here, you are a family here, God may want to use you as you love an international student to show them the way to salvation. And you never know, that person may be a vaccine who will go and plant 10,000 churches in India or may be a Kenji whose father will be saved from Buddhism. But this Christmas, let's do something that will count for zero. And any of us can do this. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. Ah, you are so good. You've made it so easy for us to reach the world because you brought the world to us. May you show us what you want us to do as a church. And may you show us what you want us to do as families and as individuals. Let us give money. Let us give time. Let us volunteer. Let us pray. And through us, we may not be a huge church of a thousand people. We may be hundred, but we can affect millions just because we reach the world that has come to us. God, you move people. When you move us, let us obey. And when you bring people our way, may we be sensitive like Philip to your spirit and do exactly what you have called us to do. May we be strategic in reaching the world and counting for zero in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we please be on our feet and no doxology? Can you play the doxology for us? <laughs>